My name is Leticia Pomadesi. I'm a marketing specialist for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, but I'm also part of a team that works to market and promote and do outreach for the hunter and angler recruit, retain, reactivate effort known as R3. So these harvest huddle hours are something, a virtual program that we do to really help build you up and provide you a confidence booster and get you more comfortable with hunting, fishing, foraging, and shooting sports. Um, the whole purpose is to really engage with adult audiences that are just starting out or returning to their journey in hunting, fishing, foraging, and shooting sports. So again, we're so excited that you could join us and help you along this journey. So the information provided during the next hour is really meant to be a resource for you um, and build your confidence and excitement around your sport and getting outdoors. Today, we have two very informative and knowledgeable panelists that will talk about how to go about catching halibut and offering us a beginner's look at fishing sandy beaches for surf perch and other species along the coastal California area. So something to know, all of our R3H3 sessions are recorded. So if you hear something you like and you wanna share it with someone in your circle, this episode will be available on the department's R3 webpage within a few days. Okay, so before we get started, some real quick housekeeping. If you're new to Zoom, which seems funny to even say with the world that we're living in right now, all virtual, but there could be some folks out there. So if you're new to Zoom, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking on the top right icons. There are two views, gallery and presenter. We recommend presenter mode for today, but you can play around with it and you know how, you, how your screen looks doesn't affect how anyone else's looks. So feel free to just you know do whatever you like. <laughs> At the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for audience participation with a Q&A. And for this, we're going to use the Q&A feature. Shocking, right? <laughs> that uh, is located at the bottom of your screen. It's the icon that looks like two little text bubbles. So if you click that to open up the dialog box, then you type in your questions there, hit enter, and those will be submitted to our background moderators that are going to try and answer all of your questions. No question is too big, too small. Uh, inappropriate, just ask away because we really want you to be involved and engaged during this process. As I mentioned, all of the sessions are recorded and will be available on our department's R3 webpage. The website for that is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3, and we're going to pop that in the chat for you. So it's right there. Um, you can also find all the past R3 H3 recordings there under the California Wild Kitchen tab. So let's introduce our team. On Q&A, answering your questions and fielding them to our presenters, we have uh, CDFW R3 coordinator, Jen Benedict, and Robert Karam from the R3 team out of the Office of Communication, Education, and Outreach. And from our marine region, we also have John Ugaritz and Travis Buck. So big thank you to them for helping us out today, again, with this larger group that we have. So we are gonna do our best to answer everyone during the event, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered or if it's kind of outside the scope of today's presentation, you can just email us your questions at statewide r 3 program at wildlife.ca.gov and we'll also add that to the chat for you as well. Now for our fabulous presenters, Christine Lacina is an environmental scientist with CDFW. She has been studying the life history of fish for the department's marine region for about 10 years. She says she has a passion for fishing and studying the murky and perplexing waters of San Francisco Bay and the diversity of fishes it supports. Getting slimy in the field, dissecting fish in the lab, working under the microscope, observing fishery operations, and collaborating with fishermen are some of her favorite ways to help address management concerns. Now, Travis Tanaka is also an environmental scientist with the Marine Region's Northern Central California Finfish Research Management Project. He's been with the department um, for more than 20 years and worked on studies pertaining to salmon, market squid, and Pacific sardine. His current work includes California halibut and Pacific hagfish. He's an avid hunter and recreational fisherman with many years of experience pursuing food for the table. He and Christine are very happy to share all of their knowledge with all of us today. So with that, welcome, Christine. Welcome, Travis. I'm going to let you guys take it away. All right. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Christine. Thank you, Tish, for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, Ken Odo was the original presenter for this topic, um, but unfortunately he couldn't join us. Um, and I just really quickly wanted to give a quick plug for Ken. Um, he has decades of surf fishing experience um, and he's also very well known in the surf fishing community. And we kind of refer to him as a surf fishing guru. We're also lucky enough to have him as one of our project biologists. 
Um, and I'm actually lucky, lucky enough to have been able to have been taught by him um, about how to surf fish about 10 years ago. Um, so everything that I know on this topic is based on his um, amazingly deep well of knowledge. Um, so my love for surf fishing kind of has roots in fish biology. Um, I love uh, going out to the surf so I can collect fish and bring them back to the lab and, and dissect them. Um, but over the years, it's really developed into a passion and intrigue of mine. And now it's just something that I do for fun. And uh, hi, folks. Uh, I'm Travis Tanaka here. And as Tish said, I'm a longtime department employee. I've um, also been a longtime hunter and fisherman. In fact, uh, my love for hunting and fishing is what led me to my job. Uh, I figured I might as well try to be on the, the management resource end of it, as well as the consumptive user end. So thanks for joining us today. Christine, back to you. Okay, thanks, Travis. All right, so we'll get started with. Sandy beach surf fishing for beginners. Um, we're actually gonna to focus today on beaches in the central and Northern California coast area. And I'm gonna talk a lot about movement-based fishing uh, using really light tackle for surf perch. Um, and I've included a photo here of my favorite local Sandy beach in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and as you can tell, they're just a beautiful habitat to spend time in and appreciate. Um, it's a really dynamic habitat it can change day to day. Uh, it's just never gonna get boring for you. And then once you spend some time, um, you're really gonna learn how to read the surf and eventually you'll be able to identify um, like fishy looking structure at a glance. Okay, so let's get into um, why should you fish the surf? Well, to start off with, it's it's easily accessible. This is obviously like a very common habitat along the California coastline. Um, and oftentimes you can find fishing opportunity within a short walk from, from the parking lot. Um, I also like that it's not heavy on logistics. I'm always changing my plans last minute um, and surf fishing can um, really accommodate that. Um, so for example, I like to walk my dog on the beach after work, and if the surf is looking like really good or particularly fishy that day, all I have to do is run home, grab my fishing rod and my pre-packed fishing backpack and just go down to the beach. Um, it's also affordable. Uh, you don't need expensive gear and you don't need a boat, which is a big bonus. Um, once you invest in a rod and reel, and I think you should be able to find something decent for about $100, you can maintain that gear for years. Um, so long as, you know, you take care of it. Um, number one rule for beach fishing is you want to keep your reel out of the sand. If you get sand in the gears, that's going to destroy it pretty quickly. Um, always give it a fresh water rinse at the end of the day. You're going to want to break down your rod, um, and don't put it in the car still assembled, um, and then store everything inside out of the sun. So Christine, I have a really good, uh, life hack here for those of us that do the outdoors, I carry in the back of my truck a gallon and a half container of water so I can use it to wash my hands or in the case of beach fishing, use it to rinse my equipment. So then when I get home, it's been rinsed. It is now dry. You don't have the crusty salt buildup and it, you know, then you can go ahead and store your gear accordingly. Yeah, awesome. Um, that's a great tip. So yeah, if you remember, bring, bring along some fresh water with you, keep it in the back of your car. Um, they even make um, like portable showers now. So if you wanted some water pressure, you could probably find something um, with, with a hose. Um, surf fishing is also really great exercise. It's very easy to get five miles in if you're working hard to find the fish and then follow them down the beach. And you're also walking on sand, which really strengthens your leg muscles. And the best part is you probably won't even notice how far you're walking, especially if you're really into looking, looking at the beach structure and trying to find those fish. Uh, surf fishing can go either way in terms of finding solitude or being social. If you look at the top photo on the left side of the slide, um, Ken actually took this photo in the Pacifica area back in the 80s or 90s. And this is during a big striper run. Um, I don't really particularly like fishing when there's that many people that close to me. Um, so it, as you can see in the next two photos, um, sometimes you find solitude and you can't see another soul for miles. Um, so I do really like that it can go both ways. Um, sometimes I just go down to the beach and put my headphones in and enjoy being outside. 
Um, other times I enjoy meeting up with the other beach regulars. It's been a really easy way to meet my neighbors, uh, feel like part of the community. Um, and an opportunity, it's been an opportunity to meet people that I probably wouldn't have had a chance to interact with otherwise. Now I get excited to see them when I show up on the beach at the same time as they do. I mean, finally, there's always something new to learn. This is like a really dynamic habitat. Um, so once you think you've learned the structure, well, the next wall event can change everything. And so that, that changing structure really um, adds to the challenge, but it also adds to the reward in finding the fish. Okay, so let's go over uh, what, what you need to get started. Well, obviously you're gonna need a rod and reel. Um, I use a medium action graphite spinning rod and reel. Um, and if you look, uh, the photo on the upper right corner of the slide, that's actually the spinning reel that I use. Um, and I do recommend that for beginners. I think that's probably one of the easiest to cast out into the surf. Um, so maybe try that setup initially. Uh, generally, you can cast further with a heavier rod, but if you choose heavier gear, then you're probably gonna sacrifice your mobility a little bit. So that's something to think about. Um, a rod between eight to nine feet in length, um, that's rated for a quarter to one ounce lure is going to work well. Uh, but really what it comes down to is choosing a rod it involves personal preference and even personality. I always like imagine rod shopping was kind of like trying to find the right wand in Harry Potter. So just ask for recommendations when you go to your local tackle shop. Um, I mean, and who knows, you might decide you want to try fly fishing with surf. Um, you might decide you want to try using a conventional reel, um, and these are also known as uh, bait, uh, bait casters or level winds. Um, and then you might even decide you want to try using heavier gear and staking out a spot on the beach instead of moving. And my, my, one of my neighbors is pictured on the bottom right, and that's exactly what he's doing. Um, okay, so I actually emptied out my surf fishing backpack so you guys can see what I, what I always take down to the beach with me. So number one, I bring extra line, um, extra terminal tackle, and terminal tackle involves uh, weight, speed, swivels, and hooks. Um, I do like to fish with the lightest gear that I can get away with. Uh, so that means I'm always bringing down um, like multiple weight sizes, and then I just like modify my terminal tackle setup depending on the surf conditions that day. Um, so yeah, my advice to, is to always bring options. Um, and also bring a cutting device in case you need to retie or want to retie. Uh, bring bait uh, lures or flies, or be prepared to dig up sand crabs. Um, you always wanna carry needle nose pliers, um, and the reason for that is to unhook fish. Um, and some surf species actually have a minimum size, so you wanna be prepared um, with a measuring device. So Christine, question for you. Sure. So I see you got your pack there and you put a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. Where do you put your fish? Uh, okay, so a lot of the time I'm, I'm perch fishing. Um, I don't recommend carrying a, like a hard cooler down to the beach with you because you don't want to leave something behind um, and worry about it. So I, I like the pack because it helps me stay mobile. Um, so I will bring Ziploc bags for perch and I will keep those in my pack. Um, but if you catch a larger fish, like a striper, that's actually what this orange rope is for. So you could um, thread that through the gills and out through the mouth, and then um, either like attach that to your pack somehow or your waders. Um, and speaking of waders, I would say that those are optional. <laughs> um, I do wear mine when it's cold or rainy, or if I'm gonna be fishing for more than like two hours on the central coast. Um, but if I can get away with it, I'll just wear leggings and my tennis shoes if I'm hiking down the beach or neoprene booties um, to keep my feet warm. Okay, so I fish a Carolina rig for surf perch. Um, this is really a great, simple, effective setup for beginners. Um, and that, so because of that, that's what I'm gonna cover in detail today. Um, I do like it because it's quick and easy to retie. It's also inexpensive to retie if you happen to lose it. Um, it's adaptable. You can change the weight size and the leader length to give your bait like more or less action depending on the surf that day. 
And you can also adjust your hook size um, based on what's biting. Um, so maybe say you're feeling like you're getting a lot of bites, but you're not hooking anything, then you're probably gonna wanna drop your hook size. Um, or if you get to the beach and you're ready for surf first and you find out there's a striper run, then you're probably gonna wanna increase your hook size. Um, so I just say I really encourage like exploring it by adjusting your gear based on the conditions that way. And then eventually you'll learn how to set yourself up for success initially. Um, and I, I just wanted to say really quickly, I wouldn't really say that one gear type outfish is another, um, just that you get good at fishing the type of gear that you use. So my personality is kind of impatient. So I use lighter gear, like I disappear for miles down the beach and I try to find the fish. Um, but my neighbors who are very wise, um, just stand in their one spot and they mostly wait for the fish to come to them. Um, and we, we both do well fishing the same beach. All right, so let's get into what a Carolina rig is. Um, it's simply a sliding egg sinker, as you can see here. Um, and I usually use a one ounce weight in the San Francisco area. Um, I did have to go up to one and a half the other day, but that um, is probably as heavy as I would go um, with my perch set up. Um, and then following the egg sinker, um, you're gonna wanna put on a bead. Um, and the function of the bead is to protect the knot from shaking. And then next up, you're gonna uh, wanna put on a barrel swivel. And these are really important for surf fishing. Um, there's lots of action and these, um, they spin. So that is gonna minimize your line from twisting and knotting. Um, next up, you're gonna tie on your leader line. Um, my average leader length is probably about like one and a half feet, um, but you can go up to four feet. And I do use a 10 pound mono monofilament on my leader line. And then I tie off to size four or six hook uh, for perch. Um, so there's, there's tons of videos available online for learning how to tie knots. Um, but I typically use a clinch knot for my monofilament and then palomar knot for my braided line. Um, and I do like using braided lines since it has no stretch and that can make it a little bit easier to feel the bites. I mean, I use a 20 pound braid on my reel. So for bait, I am, I'm totally hooked on these camo mimic sandworms. And I'm actually gonna show you how I hook one on. Um, so I'm just going to open up my bolt bag here um, and make sure that you seal that gulp bag because that bait can dry out pretty quickly. Um, so what you're going to do is just put the hook um, through the nose of the worm, slide it up until you reach the bend in the hook, then push it through. And then you're gonna to wanna to pull the head of the worm up just past your knot. And the reason I do that is because the knot is actually gonna hold it in place um, a little bit better. Um, you want your, your bait to look natural and straight like this. Um, and alternatively, you could um, nose hook a grub as you can see on the slide on the right. All right, so surf fishing is really fun because you just, you're not sure of what you're gonna catch next, um, but you can decide what, you're, uh, what you like to target by changing up your rig, your baits or your lures, um, and also to target something you wanna consider the species biology, a time of year, and also your loca location. In my opinion, surf perch are the favorite fish of California waters. They're super fun to catch. They're scrappy and aggressive. And there's um, generally five perch species that you could commonly encounter in the surf. And these are all pictured on the slide, um, but barred and red tail are probably the most commonly targeted. Um, and that's due to their size and availability. So a good size for barred and red tail is in the one to two pound range, um, but they can get up to over four pounds. You can find barred uh, from Bodega Bay all the way south to Mexico, and then Red tail are more common north of San Francisco Bay and into Washington state. 
Um, you can target them year round. There's generally peaks of good fishing when they aggregate, ag aggregate to mate or give birth. And the timing of that can vary with the um, latitude and the species. And surfers are really cool because they're actually live bears. They give birth to fully developed young that just look like a mini version of the parent. So although surfers are my favorite target, um, I often find that other anglers on the beach are get more excited about uh, striped bass. So if you're targeting striped bass or halibut, I definitely recommend uh, trying different options to change up your terminal tackle for your gear. Um, for example, I've seen anglers have really good success with top water lures for striper. Um, so striped bass can be caught from Southern California to Oregon, but they're most common around San Francisco Bay. You can target them during the day, but also at night. And schoolies, which are uh, fish that are five to six pounds or under, start showing up in the spring. Um, then the larger fish start showing up in the summertime and they can be caught through October. So you could get lucky with a 40 pound fish, but a great catch is um, in the 20 pound range. Uh, California halibut can also be caught in the surf. Um, you're gonna wanna try fishing uh, maybe in the spring inside uh, bays or like really protected areas with low surf. Um, if the surf is starting to get really heavy, that's probably gonna push them further offshore and um, make them less accessible um, to shore casting. They're definitely more commonly targeted by surf anglers down in SoCal, um, but we do have some effort on the beaches in Central and Northern California. And of course, Travis is gonna tell us more about halibut fishing later on. And lastly, and I kind of feel like this is like the honorable mention category, another like often overlooked surf fishing favorite of mine is the jack smelt. I think they're totally fun to catch and they kind of like remind me of mini surf tunas. Okay, so let's get into beach structure. Um, you're gonna use this to decide where to cast. Um, learning how to read the water and using that to locate fish is really rewarding, um, but it's probably also the most challenging aspect of surf fishing. Uh, what I don't recommend is um, like just getting to the beach and if you see a group of anglers stationed in one spot, don't just assume that they're in the only place where the fish are. Um, go have fun exploring for yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a couple different types of structure that uh, can either hold fish because they're concentrating prey on the edges or because the fish are using them as deep, deeper water highways for movement. Um, so we'll start with rips. Um, it's pro they're probably the most commonly known in the beach structure category. Um, these are deeper channels that run 90 degrees to the beach. And you can identify them generally by a break, look for a break in cresting waves and then like foamy churned up water that's getting pulled offshore. Um, troughs are deeper channels that run parallel to the beach. So maybe you're gonna see like, darker green water um, and where the waves aren't breaking as much close to shore, but then a little further out, you'll see like a shallower sandbar and cresting waves. Um, flats are like what they, what they sound like, broad, shallow areas with very little structure. Um, so what you're gonna look for is uniformity basically um, in the cresting waves and how the water's behaving. So these can actually hold foraging fish on the incoming tides, which can be surprising because they're pretty shallow in some cases. Um, and then probably like a more, it's, this is like a little bit more challenging to find. Um, holes are uh, more subtle, but basically what they are is deep pockets of water. Um, so you wanna look for maybe uh, darker green areas of water that are like breaking up cresting waves in a whole shape. Um, and finally, I just want to recommend that you cheat. Um, it's your, if it's your first time going to beach, go at the low tide, um, watch the surf as it comes in. Um, this is really going to bolster your ability to read the surf. Okay, so in addition to looking at beach structure um, to find like a promising place to cast, you can also look for fish, birds, and prey items. Um, if, you're, if you're lucky, you might see splashing fish. You might even be able to see dark spots moving underneath the surface. Um, 
You can also look for bird um, or even marine mammal activity. Diving birds are usually a sign that fish are in the area. You could also see harbor seals, um, sea lions and dolphins working the surf. Um, but normally though, I spend my time looking for sand crabs. These are the number one prey item of surf fishes. Surf perch and striped bass will vacuum these up. So try casting in front of bountiful sand crab beds. And sand crabs actually like leave tracks in the sand, um, as you can see in the photo on the right. Um, so try and locate those areas and then cast in front of them. And if you're using sand crabs as a uh, natural bait, you're, you're gonna wanna look for um, orange eggs. Um, surfish do seem to prefer those. And then also soft shell sand crabs. Um, sand crabs actually molt um, when, when they grow, so they leave their old shell behind. And um, surf, perch, surf fish in general, like definitely seem to like the soft shells a little bit better. Um, and Ken always told me to maintain an open mind. Um, so try, uh, try a cast or two in places that don't seem promising. You might find fish or you might learn something about um, why the water's moving the way that it is. All right, so before you hit the beach, um, checking the surf forecast is very important um, for safety reasons. And if you get there and it's looking really rough or really windy, um, find something else to do. The fish are probably still out there, um, but they're gonna be a lot harder to catch, um, especially for beginners. Um, you're also gonna to wanna to know the tide. That's also important for safety, um, but it can help you in the surf fishing learning process. Um, tides are important, but really you can catch fish at all tide stages. Um, I do prefer to fish the incoming or the tide change. Water movement, I think, is really key to good fishing. Um, I definitely don't like fishing when conditions are too calm. Um, and I think that's because the sand crabs are moving in and out during the tidal changes and then they're uncovered by the crashing surf and that exposes them to fish who are gonna then target those areas to feed. A time of day can also be important. Um, try going early or late in the day. Surfish tend to be more active then. Um, and as a bonus, there's less people on the beach and generally less wind. And so to figure out the tide and surf forecast, there's tons of options available online. I also recommend a paper tide log. So then you can kind of take down notes on your fishing success that day. Um, and some of the websites that I use are surfforecast.com and tidesforfishing.com. And I think Tish is gonna link those in the chat for us. Okay, so real quick, safety. Um, please don't be the guy in the photo. I find myself like repeating this over and over. Minimize how much you're wading into the surf. Like you really don't need to go above your knees. And if you're feeling the need for some reason to um, cast further, change up your gear so you can do that or wait for the tide or the surf conditions to change so you can fish the area that you're feeling the need to wade out to. And this especially applies if you're uh, fishing a rip um, if the worst happens, swim parallel to shore and um, then swim in to get out of the rip, um, just ditch your gear, making it back shore is far more important. Um, and another um, a very important tip for surf fishing is that you need to stay upright um, in order to main control. So basically just minimize the risk of anything that could cause a fall. Uh, so some hazards to be wary of, um, again, check the surf forecast before you go. Large swell can be dangerous, especially if you're fishing on a steep beach. Um, those can produce these plunging breakers, which are really forceful and fast waves. Um, also avoid um, loose sand in combination with heavy swell. That's um, gonna make it harder for you to keep your footing. Um, also be careful wading around river mouse and know how to identify a rip. Um, also watch the incoming tide. You don't want to get stranded on um, a pocket beach. So to mitigate your risk, um, don't turn your back on the ocean. Um, Ken always says keep your head on a swivel. That's really good advice to so look behind you for people or dogs that are walking by before you cast. Also keep an eye out for debris that could get washed towards you and knock you over. So that involves things like looking out for logs, rafts of seaweed. There's chunks of concrete, a come across a rebar. Those are all tripping hazards. Um, if you can fish with a buddy um, or at least, you know, acknowledge other anglers when you get down to the beach, um, they'll naturally keep an eye out for you and you can do the same for them. Um, and then you can also wear a PFD.
Okay, so finally, um, I just wanted to pass along a few pointers for how to be a responsible angler. Um, definitely spend some time learning how to identify your local surf fish species. And we have a great surf perch photo ID guide available on our website. And um, I think Tish is gonna link this as well in the chat. And the reason it's so important to learn how to identify your catch is because there's species specific bag limits um, and also minimum size limits. So as of today, red tail surf perch are the only surf perch with a minimum size limit. Um, and they are identifiable by this red coloration in the tail. Um, and then also um, these high arching spines in the dorsal fin. Um, and striped bass and halibut also have minimum size limits. So basically it's, it's good practice to carry a measuring device, something light like this will work really well so you can keep it easily accessible um, and make sure that when you're measuring your fish you're putting it on top of your measuring device um, so you get an accurate measurement don't um, measure over the top of your catch and when you go to release your catch um, make sure you're handling your fish with wet hands um, also carry those needle nose pliers to quickly remove the hook um, if the fish is gut hooked you don't want to pull the, the hook out because um, that could damage the internal organs. Um, just go ahead and maybe cut the line as close as you can to the mouth. Um, and then for release, you want to walk back into the surf and gently ease the fish back into the water. Maybe try and time it with an outgoing wave. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to wish you all good luck on your surf fishing adventures and we'll switch gears to Travis, who's going to talk about halibut fishing. Okay, thank you, Christine. So let's uh, change over. Okay. Setting up my screen here. Technology is great when it works. There we go. All right, let's get started here. So as Christine, thank you for that great surf fishing tutorial. My name is Travis. I'm gonna introduce all of you to the wonderful world of California halibut fishing. Uh, for the purposes of my talk, I'm gonna to refer to California halibut simply as halibut. Today, we're gonna to talk about rods and reels, tackle, give you some resources for information, how to identify your catch, a few tips on fighting your fish, you know, and then, See where this session goes from there. A uh, couple things about this particular slide. You'll notice a lucky angler with a very nice halibut catch. He's holding up by what's called a gaff. Uh, for those who don't know, a gaff is a very large hook used to land and assist bringing aboard legal sized fish. Uh, if you do gaff a fish, make sure it's legal before doing so, but also consult the regulations to see which species are legal to gaff. So you've decided you want to go halibut fishing, but you don't own any equipment. So you're going to find that rod and reel tackle appropriate for halibut is quite diverse. In fact, there's a lot of gear can be used for multiple fisheries. So whatever you end up getting for halibut, you could use for rockfish, salmon, or you know white sea bass or anything else. So for example, a lot of gear can range from bass fishing equipment all the way out to what's termed deep sea gear. So let's talk rods first. So rods have what's called an action, but also line weight. So there are three action types, 
fast, medium, and slow. Uh, fast action rods bend from the last third to the tip, medium from roughly the middle to the tip, and then slow, which in full bend looks more like a macaroni. Uh, rods are also rated for, for line weight. So you might have a rod rated for 10 or 12 pound test up to 30. You could have a rod from 50 to 100. Typically when you have a range, I suggest fishing the middle. In fact, a lot of times manufacturers will also put on the suggested line weight for that particular rod. Now, personally, I have rods for both fishing, for fishing bait, as well as trolling. This is my bait fishing setup. This is a 30 pound rated rod. I currently fish it with 20 pound test. It's a little lighter tip because of the line weight. Fast action, notice the bend is on the last third. This allows me to be able to feel the bite, but also enough leverage and power to be able to lift the fish off the bottom. Now a rod that I use for trolling, this is a heavier, this is a little heavier rod, rated for up to 50 pound. I fish this with 30 and 40 pound test. A little stiffer on the tip, again, fast action, get a lot of leverage. Uh, this is an example of a rod I can use for trolling for halibut, trolling for salmon, even bottom fishing. Just like rods, reels are variable as shown in this slide here, you have a couple of what's called conventional reels. If you open up, let's say a mail order catalog to a particular distributor, they'll show saltwater conventional, saltwater spin. Uh, the conventional reels are the two on the left of the slide, the spinning reel that's the one on the right. A lot of times you'll see people using uh, long surf rods with spinning gear. Uh, my particular reels, like I said, they're kind of matched the size of the rod. You want to make sure that they're able to hold at least a couple hundred yards of line, depending upon the line weight. When it comes to line, I like around 20 pound test or so for fishing bait and then 30 or 40 for trolling. Now, as far as knots go, uh, the best knot is the one that you tie best. So whatever you practice on, if you tie a Palomar, Palomar really well, make, just continue doing so. Uh, I like the uni knot. There's another knot called the San Diego Jam that I tie. So shop around, depending upon your budget, you could spend a little, you could spend a lot. There's a lot of quality rod and reel combinations available for under $200. Uh, here's a little bit of a pro tip for you. I've found a lot of really good gear at yard sale and estate sales. Uh, yard sales aren't just for antiques. I've found bottom fish gear, I've found troll gear, you know, real freshwater stuff. You know, so take a stop by when you see a, a yard sale sign. Now you don't necessarily need a specialized set of equipment for every single situation, but tackle acquisition is fun. So the other thing that you wanna make sure you budget for is have a, definitely have a pair of pliers and a measuring device, which we'll talk about later. If you're a boat-based angler, having a knotless landing net is also a good investment. So you have your rod, you have your reel, what do I throw in the water? Well, the sky's the limit when it comes to lures and rigs for halibut. Uh, the key is, I like to find the color and the action combo that's gonna draw the bite. Primarily, I go by the phrase, match the hatch. You know, halibut are, will feed on invertebrates, thin fish, you know, variety of things. So I try to figure out what they're feeding on that particular day or in that area. But you can also throw lures that are gonna encourage more of an aggression bite that are really flashy and create a lot of disturbance. Halibut, of course, will always bite a live bait, and then they'll also bite frozen baits as well. Uh, you wanna make sure you keep enough weight on there to keep your gear on the bottom. For my fishing, I like to keep things very simple, uh, small tackle kits. If I'm casting, I like to fish rubber swim baits. These baits come in a variety of lengths and colors and you know different size paddle tails. So when these are going through the water, the tail's swimming back and forth. But I also like to fish frozen anchovies. And I'll even throw a squid. So typically there are three ways to present your offering. You can cast and slowly retrieve baits or lures. That's where these guys come in. Uh, I have a friend of mine, he likes to, he pins on a squid and he'll use this as his lure. He'll cast it and retrieve it, cast and retrieve it. 
You can do that from shore, from a pier. You can even do it from a boat. Uh, I fish off an inflatable trout pontoon boat and I'll cast using that. Uh, now you can also have your offering deployed while underway at a slow speed, which is called trolling, typically done in a power vessel, but you can do that in a float tube, you know, kayak, you know, anything like those lines that'll get you out on the water. Uh, for those vessel-based anglers, Many will troll what's called a bounce ball rig. That's the rig that's on the right side of the slide there. Uh, the bounce ball or lead will basically skip along the bottom. So as it hits, it creates a little a plume of sand, which the halibut's gonna hear the thump, but then they'll see the disturbance and then they're gonna come over. So hopefully they're gonna see it come over and take a look at what you got out there. In this particular kit, they have a dodger, which in a circular motion also acts as an attractant. So hopefully a seizure, seizure offering and hope you get a bite. But lastly, a lot of anglers will drift live bait, they'll drift frozen baits, uh, you can drift lures. If you use a trap hook rig with your frozen anchovy, that could help minimize missed bites. So a lot of, a lot of commercially made halibut rigs are a trap hook rig, which is, shown by this illustration here. So you wanna use these with like your frozen squid, you can use them with your frozen anchovy, uh, you can even use trap hook rigs on lures such as hoochies. There's one example, here's another example. Hoochies come in a variety of colors and sizes. And these you can fish with trap rig. Uh, if you fish live bait, like for example, there's a lot of places now that offer live anchovies. I would suggest using a single hook. Uh, using the trap rig on a live bait will actually alter how the bait swims, but also cause your bait to expire faster. Now in the trap hook rig, the J hook slides, depending on the length of your bait. And then you, so you pin the J hook through the mouth and out through the top of the head of the bait, and then adjust your length and then put the treble hook in the tail. So this rig usually is used drifting, but again, you can use it certainly for trolling. So the left graphic shows the, the business end of a bounce ball rig. You have the Dodger, which is your attracting device, have the hoochie with the trap hook rig. And then you'll notice on the right side there, there are a couple of different options for drifting. I like to use the dropper loop rig. I tie mine with a three-way swivel, now the length of the leaders, those are all, those are suggestions of this particular author, that's what they like. My length from the dropper or the three-way to my sinker is about a foot because when I'm going through the water and I'm drifting, my bait's actually held closer to the bottom. If you go with a longer lead, then your bait's gonna be higher up, which can also help with visibility. And then the, the bottom rig there, that's the bounce ball rig you're gonna use for trolling. As the author suggests, and I, I do too as well, make sure you use a little heavier rod. You wanna use a little heavier line, like 30 or 40 pound test, because what happens is when the fish bites, that way it's gonna stick better, with much better hook set. But also, if you do have a fish on, you're also not having the, you got that sinker swinging around well. So you're gonna have to deal with the sinker as well as the fish. Now, there's a couple of tips for, if you get your fish, you get bit, I'm now hooked up and I see this a lot on YouTube videos. So you have your rod, you see them, somebody's excited and jerking the rod back and forth. Let's get that adjusted there. What I like to do, I'm using my rod for maximum leverage. So there's a couple things you can do. You can hold the rod at roughly say 10 o'clock or so crank and just keep crank and keep that bend in the rod. The rod's acting as a shock absorber, keeping tension on that line. The other thing you could do is you can pump the rod. So if you come from, let's say at nine, nine o'clock, 9.30, you lift slow to about 11 o'clock and then you reel down as you're coming back down to nine. What you're doing that is lifting the fish up, reeling in your slack. What you, like, what you want to avoid doing is any herky-jerky movements. You don't want to go lift up, drop it down, but without the cranking, because what that, that, that puts a lot of stress on your line, but also makes the fish start behaving erratically. 
you get the fish to the surface, keep the fish underwater. When they come up, they'll lie flat. Halibut don't come up this way, they come up horizontally. So keep the fish below the surface, that'll keep them calmer. Hopefully if you're fishing with a buddy, they can stand next to you with the net and then scoop the fish as you bring it close to the boat. If you're fishing on your own, I'm right-handed, so I will tuck the rod underneath my left arm here, hold it for as a leverage point, crank, just keeping the tension on, and then I can use my right hand to either gaff or use my landing net. So you have all your equipment. When do I go fishing? Where do I go fishing? Well, the easy answer is you go fishing anytime you can, and then you go try the sandy spot close to home. Uh, there is no season for halibut other than when the fish show up at a shallow sandy location near you. Uh, currently in my area, for example, Monterey Bay, the peak of the season typically is in July, but fish are usually around between April and October. And sometimes we've had them here as early as March, late as November. Of course, the presence of feed and warmer water temperature is important. Hey, Travis, real quick, you mentioned shallow, but um, how shallow should you be fishing? Okay, shallow. Uh, the, sh the term shallow, that's kind of an it depends sort of a thing. It depends on where you are, swell condition, tidal conditions. So for example, open ocean fishing on a beach with a boat, you could be drifting in 20 feet of water. You could be at 60 feet of water if, if, there's, if the waves are breaking over. Uh, if you're fishing in an enclosed bay, for example, like San Francisco, you could be as shallow as 10 feet. Uh, typically, because halibut are coming up into the shallows for spawning and feeding, I would suggest anglers start around 100 feet of water and then set their drift as their vessel moves in closer to uh, the shore. Now, if you're casting from the beach, you're hitting it from the other way around. I will try to pick days with minimal tidal movement or small ground swell, uh, fish the incoming high. Halibut are sight feeders, so the less water disturbance, you know, if it's all cloudy, they can't see what to eat. Uh, I like to fish the incoming high that's bringing in nutrients, that's bringing in bait fish, stuff that halibut are gonna be pursuing. Uh, but the other half is that if there's a south swell or south current, Experience has taught me to stay home, do chores, and earn points to go fishing some other time. For whatever reason, southerlies, fish just don't bite. Uh, now, if you don't have access to a boat, you do have other options. You can try halibut from shore. There's a lot of anglers that do well from casting, walking and casting, walking and casting. We do that here at Monterey Bay, uh, real popular in Southern California. You can take a trip down to your local pier. You can book a spot on our charter vessel targeting halibut. So there's lots of opportunities for non-vessel owners. So a couple of notes on charter vessels, uh, sometimes known as you know, party boats, cattle boats, passenger for hire vessels. Basically charter vessels, you're paying someone else to take you fishing. So do your research, uh, wherever you might live, see where the closest port of landing, give them a call, see if they offer halibut trips. Some will offer rods for rent, tackle for sale. Some will even include that as part of the fare. And if you're new, when you get on board, tell the deckhand, hey, I'm new to halibut fishing. I've never done it before. They're professionals. Vessel crews are there for your safety, but also to make sure and ensure that you have the best day that you can. So Christine, as someone who's uh, had many halibut trips up in your way, do you have any other tips for our huddlers? Sure, yeah, if, uh, if you're riding a party boat and you're bringing your own gear, um, in particular your own weights, um, just make sure that you're putting on the same size weight as um, the people around you. Um, and the reason for that is uh, you wanna try and minimize tangling. If you're tangled, you're not gonna catch a fish. So just check in with the deckhand about, about the types of weights that they're using. Yep, that's a, that's a good one. Okay, so you think you've caught a halibut. Now, this is an excellent portrayal of a halibut. So a few identifying characteristics, of course, is the mouth of sharp teeth. Uh, don't test that one. But better yet is the high lateral arch. Okay, so halibut have a high lateral arch. So the lateral line is here, but then it comes up in this big bump. This is an excellent characteristic. They have a double truncate tail, meaning there's, there's the lobe, 
indentation lobe and then indentation lobe. Of course, they have the oval body shape as well as a fin that's even width throughout from tail to the head. You might run into some other kinds of flatfish or maybe even sublegal halibut and undersized fish are referred to as shakers. There isn't a minute, there currently is not a minimum length for these other flatfishes, but they are considered federal ground fish and may have seasonal or possession limits. So please consult your regulations for details. So you've determined that you, what you have is a halibut. Uh, as of today, a halibut must be 22 inches or longer. The way you measure your catch, of course, is the mouth closed. Go from the, the nose or the mouth to the longest lobe of the tail, but without manipulating, fanning, stretching, wherever the tail falls, that's your measurement. If it's 22 or longer, it's legal to keep. Currently, the possession limit is three north of Point Conception, five below. And we always, of course, encourage anglers to be the best stewards of the resource and particular sublegals as they can. Uh, try to minimize handling the shakers to improve release survivalship. Some tips include using wet hands, uh, avoid putting your fingers underneath gill plates. You know, if you got to hold the fish, hold it with two hands, support the body. Don't just hold the fish by the tail. And of course, this uh, photo here shows a way you can hold the fish, but also with removing the hook. And if it's hooked too deep, you can't get it out, cut it off and get that fish back in the water. Just a quick note on fin splits. If you have to net your sublegal fish uh, using a knotless mesh like this will help minimize fin splittings. Uh, that'll be something that's very helpful to release survivorship. Travis, can you explain exactly what you mean by a knotless small mesh net? Okay, so a lot of us are used to seeing nets like this with mesh that are made out with knots. Uh, notice this net does not. It's basically a, a fabric. What happens with halibut is that when they're, if this is the fin, when it hits this mesh, it'll actually split like that, which opens up the fish to infection in those areas. So the marine region, we do have some information that you can access when you're out on the water. This uh, sport fishing map is an online tool, allows you to find regulations relative to where you are, MPA boundaries, depth, uh, as well as other regulation restrictions. It does run off a wireless signal, but it has been tested at sea and works at most coastal areas of the state. And if there's a question that we can't answer for you today, Send it to our Ask Marine. Uh, these are for marine specific questions. Ask Marine at wildlife.ca.gov. Uh, the staff that monitor will take your email and send it to the staff member that can address it. Uh, we also have a marine species portal page. That's the marine species link. Here you'll find a lot of information on all sorts of marine species, plants, inverts, fin fish. And lastly, there's our ocean sport fish link. Here's your regs, updates, hotline phone numbers, that sort of thing. And on behalf of Christine, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So I'll leave that to Jen. And yeah, yes. I'm actually gonna, gonna take it, Travis. Uh, you guys have sparked so many questions. Um, I'm gonna let everyone know we're going to stay on a little bit longer past one and try to answer as many questions as you can. But if you have to jump off and continue with your day, that's fine. Again, remember that this session is recorded. We got a lot of questions about that. Where can we get this recording when it's when it's all said and done? So um, for that, yes, it's being recorded. It'll be up on our um, R3 webpage, which is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3. We'll put that in the chat for you so it's fresh in your minds. And again, if you have to jump off, we totally understand. We just had so much information that we crammed into this hour and we have a lot of questions. So I'm also gonna to get to some of those for Travis and Christine. Um, so just jumping right in, Christine, you mentioned knots that you prefer and how there are good videos to teach knot tying. Was it trial and error you preferring those knots or can you just tie any knot or you know, do you recommend researching knots before you go out? Yeah, I recommend researching. Um, a lot of the fishing websites now will actually tell you um, what knot is best for the rig that you're using. So look into that. Um, I For surf fishing, I go with a quick and easy thing. And, you know, um, for surf perch, you're not going to need something that's terribly strong. So 
yeah, just do your research and yeah, follow those little videos and tutorials online. All right, great. Um, so is there a cycle for when sand crab molts? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head at the moment. Um, that's yeah, it's okay. pretty, we can come back to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. You'll see the bolts lined up um, at the top of the surf. Okay. And how much does water temp affect bite for surf perch? Um, I, I do think it has an impact. Um, right now, the water temp is a little bit colder and surf perch has been a little bit slow in the local area. So I've actually been putting off some of my surf fishing trips, waiting for it to come above 55 locally. Okay. Um, we got this question multiple times. How do you know when you have a perch on the line and not just the surf pulling on your line and wait? And how often should you reel in and cast? Okay. Oh, okay. Both of those are really great, great questions. Um, all right. So I think bites kind of feel like a, like a knocking on the end of your line. Um, but you know, as you, as you're reeling in and your weight's kind of hitting rocks or, um, like other hard substrate that can also feel like a bite. So if you're not sure you can actually check, check your bait. Um, for example, if you're using one of these worms and it's getting and the baits getting pulled down past your knot that can be a good indication that you had a fish nibbling on there versus um, a rock and then for me i'm um the way that i'm fishing i'm constantly casting out and reeling in um you want to you want to reel slowly um but you always want your line to be taut okay um, we got this one a few times also. Um, how do you prepare surf perch without it getting mushy? Okay, <laughs> I've heard, I've heard um, fried fish balls um, Okay, be a good way to prepare <laughs> surf perch. I've heard that's like the most popular <laughs> recipe. Awesome. All right, um, another one. How do you know when you have a perch on the line? We got to that one. Um, are fish specific rigs halibut bounce rig, effective or just marketing, Travis? They are effective, uh, but like I said, you can, it's a matter of preference. Uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a minimalist, minimalist when it comes to fishing tackle. Like I said, my, my fishing tackle box, I have one for salmon, one for rockfish, halibut, and they're all like this big. <laughs> the bounce ball rig does work very well. You know, with that sinker skimming the bottom, that's acting as that attractant for the halibut. And then, you know, behind it, you have your flasher or your dodger and then your bait offering. So the bounce ball rig is effective. Do you necessarily have to buy one? You know, when I first started fishing, I bought rigs just to see how it was done. You know, I'd get, I'll say, oh, okay, that's how they did it. And then I would take it and then make my own from there. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to buy anything. You know, you can, if you can figure out how to engineer it yourself, certainly you can do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, another one. Do you bleed or gut fish at the beach when you catch them? Well, if it was me, uh, when fish come aboard my boat, the minute they hit the deck, I mean, they're going into the cooler or mm -hmm. the bleed box. Yes, I do bleed them right away. Uh, and then from once they're bled, they go right on ice. Uh, the more prep and care up front, the better off you're going to be. If it's some wormier species, for example, California halibut, when they die, a lot of the, if there's any parasites, they'll start to come out of the intestines and the, the organs and then into the surrounding meat, which that's why there's a, there is an incentive to gut your fish to see there. Okay. Um, but well, at I minimum, bleed and ice. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so we, I think we got through all of the questions, kind of did that rapid fire. Um, so our time together is up. We did go a little bit over. Thanks for those who stayed and uh, submitted more questions. If you didn't get your question answered, please remember you can always find resources on our R3 webpage that might help you. Or again, you could email us at statewide R3 program. I will put that uh, email in the chat too. So it's nice and refreshed for you if you, a last minute question pops up. 
So please join us for our next few R3H3 sessions, which include our first foraging huddle with a beginner's look at spring foraging. That's going to be on April 30th. And then for May, we have exciting topics on California's preference points, party tags, and the big game draw for beginners. And then an intro to cold freshwater, a beginner's guide to trout fishing. So check those out. You can find registration links by visiting the R3 calendar, by watching our social media, or by signing up to receive monthly hunter angler updates through our online licensing portal. Additionally, when you visit um, you know, the registration page, you'll see advanced hunting clinics offered through the hunter education program. So check those out. Lastly, a huge thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you so much for taking this step to educate yourself and becoming the best anglers, hunters, foragers that you can be. And again, this session will be recorded and available on our R3 page in the coming days. With that, we hope you have a great weekend and thank you for joining us for this R3H3. Thank you.